All right, everybody, let's go. Everybody out there in YouTube land, welcome. Welcome to Dialed In Live, where I am your host, Big Jim, on Big Jim Fishing on YouTube. And uh, let's see, let me get up here. And we are going to be discussing, and of course, today's episode number 45, and we're going to talk about the spawn tonight. Yep, looking forward to it. And we're also going to talk about a little something special that is celebrated every year on April 1st, which is the birth of the Navy chief. And uh, you'll see why in just a minute. I got a special guest coming on tonight. And uh, But first of all, hey, everybody out there, if you can see and hear everything real good, give me a one in the chat so that I know that everything is uh, transmitting properly, visually, and you can hear me. Give me a one, please, in the chat. And uh, if you are new to Dialed In Live, jump in the chat. Tell me where you're from, man, so I can give you a shout out, recognize you, and uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. But uh, let's see here. If you're if you are on Facebook, you can follow me on Big Jim Fishing, and also, I have Instagram, big underscore Jim underscore fishing on Instagram. If you come in late to the show, or if you would like to watch this show again, immediately at the end, I will post it on YouTube so you can go back and watch it as much as you like. I always ask my friends, man, hey, when you're at work, play it in the background, you know, and give me a thumbs up. That way I can get some views and stuff like that. But I really appreciate it. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in tonight's co-host, which is Chris Fondren. Good evening, good evening. Chris, how you doing, bud? Man, doing great, Jim. How about you? Good, good. Are you ready to talk about the spawn tonight? I'm always ready to talk about anything fishing. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> but uh, before I bring up my special guest tonight, uh, let's see, I want to take care of some housekeeping. And believe me, guys, it isn't a chore for me because I really love these companies that I associate with. We want to thank Phoenix Boats and Nashville Marine for putting us in, in our opinion, the best boat in the market. Uh, Nashville Marine's got a new 721 on the floor. I saw a picture of it today. So if you're in the market for a 721, give Nashville Marine a call. All the links for these uh, sponsors of Big Jim Fishing and our partners are in the description of every video and every live stream, and all of my discount codes are listed. So we want to thank Powerhouse Lithium for putting the best batteries in my boat. Man, they're awesome. I love them. Solarbat sunglasses. Uh, they're the company that provides uh, my polarized prescription no-line bifocals. And they are awesome. DD26 Fishing, I'm shooting a video hopefully Wednesday if the weather doesn't blow our lake out. We're, we got a storm coming through tomorrow. But I got a new product from DD26 that I'm going to be making a video on. Yellow Bait Company, they're my plastics. They're out of Sam Raber, Texas. Great, great company, great people. They will customize any plastic that you want. Cross B Rods, and if y'all haven't checked them out yet, go to Cross B Rods and look at the Big Jim series of rods by Cross B 
and Angler Tungsten, which is the company I use for my uh, live scoping jig heads. Man, I love the Eclipse. It's a uh, it's a tungsten head, man, three eighths ounce. It shows up great. But I want to thank the partners of Big Jim Fishing. And uh, before I bring up our guest, man, I, I made an error last week on the show, and I want to correct it. Uh, Dale Hollow Lake, hashtag brother-in-law Steve, which you can see Steve Green finished 20th. He was not in check range. He was just below the check range, but he did win big fish. So that's what the $240 is. So let me, uh, let me show you what he got in the mail. Dale Hollow Lake, yeah. he got, he got the big bass. Y'all can see the check right below it there. But shout out to Steve Green, my brother-in-law, hashtag brother-in-law Steve. And we wanted to get that corrected uh, for everybody there. So let's see. I see all the ones coming in. And uh, I'm going to bring in our guest now, who is David Holloway. Welcome to the show. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. How's it going, man? Doing good. How about you? Doing great, great. I'm going to let all our viewers in on the secret here in a minute, the reason why we got you on the show. But uh, let me check in with the chat and make sure everything's good to go before we get rolling here. Uh, let's see. We got we got Trevor in the house tonight, and we got Wade. Let's go. And George Jones says, Happy birthday. It's not my actually birthday. It's the chief petty officer's birthday. Mine's in May, but thanks, George, for uh, calling that out there. Let's see. We got – oh, it's rolling. Uh, we got Brandon, first time watching live from Trialsdale County. Thanks for tuning in, bud. Appreciate it. And we got a member of Big Jim Fishing. <laughs> Hunter Taylor. Hey, Hunter, thanks for tuning in. If y'all were wondering, man, why in the world did you do that? And why does he have that little icon down there by his name? Well, Hunter is a member of the channel. And if you would like to become a member of the channel, I pinned a link in the top of the comments that you can click on and you can join the channel as a member of Team Dialed In. And you're like, well, Big Jim, what does that get you? Well, it gets you special shout outs on the show. Uh, when the chat gets to rolling, I go to my team members first. I make sure that, you know, they get on the show. And also, whenever I release a video, members get to see it 24 hours before the public. So you get the first view at what is coming out on Big Jim Fishing. So, Hunter, thanks for tuning in, buddy. And then we got Wade in the house, and we got Rick from Leesburg, Florida. Hey, thanks for tuning in, buddy. And we got Yellow Bait Company, <laughs> members of Team Dialed In. The Yellow Scope Minnow Mold was ordered today. Oh Cad will be here in a week or so. Awesome. Oh, boy. Awesome. Y'all, we will do a show to highlight the Yellow Scope Minnow. Once it comes out, and I'm really looking forward to it, and uh, yeah, we're ex we're excited about that. And let's see, we got Jonathan Kemp in the house tonight, and Justin Richardson. What's up? And East Kentucky Anglers. Hello, Big Jim and Chris. I won my first tournament of the year and was with Ford Facing Sonar. Outstanding. Let's give you a shout out. All right. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. And we're going to do this one too. Show me the money. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Congratulations, man. And then we got Brandon with Backdraft Lures. Thanks for tuning in tonight, man. And let's see. We got Michael from the borough. Hey, thanks for tuning in. Oh, and y'all look at here. The wife is checking in, in on me tonight. She's like, hey, y'all. <laughs> Let's give her a shout out. 
Thanks, Deb. Y'all are going to see her in a picture in a little while. So we're uh, y'all make sure you leave a comment about Debbie in the picture. But anyway, now that we got everything checked in and everything, man, today's topic, you know, let me pull up this picture here. Y'all bear with me. I'm a one man show. But uh, today's topic, man, we're going to talk about the spawn. And if y'all saw the thumbnail that I produced, I bet y'all were like, man, what are those three anchors there with USN and April 1st, 1893? What is that all about? Well, we're going to talk about it here. We're going to talk about it. This is April 1st. Let me get a, get over to here. And what it is, it is the birth of the chief petty officer. And y'all can see I've got on my retired master chief hat. I am retired Navy. David, who's down on the bottom there, he's a retired Navy chief. And the Navy celebrates the birthday of the Navy chief every year. Uh, normally, we'll, do, we'll read the Chief's Creed and all that, but we're not going to do that tonight. I just wanted to share a couple of things with my viewers about, you know, chief petty officers and stuff. And I pull this up because there are a couple of movies that maybe you guys have seen that have roles where a chief petty officer is very prominent. And this picture right here is from the movie U571. That's the movie. And you can see Matthew McConaughey. He is the um, person that's in charge of the vessel. At that time, he was the CEO. And the guy right beside him, which is Harvey Keitel, that is his chief. So let me pull up another uh, movie where a chief is prominent. This is from the movie Men of Honor. Robert De Niro was a master chief, and then Cuba Gooding Jr., uh, he started out as a blue shirt, but then became a chief later on through, and he's pictured as a chief right there. And then here's one of my favorite ones that I like to talk about. The movie G.I. Jane, uh, Vigo Mortensen, he is the command master chief of the training facility, and that's what I retired as, was as a command master chief. So if you ever go back and watch those videos, you'll be like, oh, man, I, I know what they are now. What it is, a chief in the Navy is E7, and then there's – let me see if i got a picture here. Here we go. Uh, the anchor on the left, that is a chief. That's E7. Then the one in the middle, if you can see, it's got a star. That's a senior chief. And the one on the right is a master chief, which is E9. So let me go back. And, you know, we talk about the birthday. Well, the government – it was signed into action on April 1st, 1893, the rank of chief petty officer because they were the chief of the, the sailors that they led. And that's when it officially became a rank. I'm not going to go over the, everything on there because uh, I don't want to bore some of you guys to death. But if you're interested in this kind of stuff, send me an email. I can send you links where you can learn about all this. But uh, there's a picture of what one of the early chiefs would look like in the Navy. Uh, let's see. And I, I wanted to show this picture because this was back when I bass fished when I made chief back in 1999 uh, was when I was up for chief. And I just wanted to show you guys, I used to live in Marrero, Louisiana, and at that time, I had kicking bass, cyclone baits, culprit, and castaway rods as my sponsors back then. And you can see the old school shirt, man, with the patches and the embroidery. But uh, that's what I looked like right there at 30 years old. Uh, you can't tell it, but I was sitting in a in uh, my first brand new Ranger boat that I had <laughs> bought back then. 99 i wasn't even in the navy yet yeah yeah well here here's a picture with my mom and dad when i was pinned in other words they put the anchors on my collar and i was actually promoted to chief in uh 2000 i'm sorry yeah 2000 and uh of course that's my mom and dad and then here's a picture uh i was in fort worth and that was when i made senior chief 
Uh, let's see. I think I was 36 years old when I made senior chief. And then uh, I couldn't find the original picture. I could only find the headshot. But that was the day that I put on Master Chief in Oceana, Virginia at VFC 12, which was 20... 2012 was when I made Master Chief. And uh, there was my first, when I became a Command Master Chief, I got that little badge on the bottom there. And uh, that's when you're like the right-hand man of the skipper, that type of thing. But that was my command picture, my first command picture that I had. And, uh, and yeah, we used to go on deck, you know, to different places. And every naval base, for the most part, had like a chief's mess, which was like a club. And here is me DJing in Key West uh, back in 2013, I think it was. We were having a good time in the chief's mess. But uh, there's a picture of me uh, right before I retired in 2016. Uh, man, I wish I was skinny like that again. Uh, <laughs> and then... Uh, here, here's when I, I retired and I walked through the bullets uh, when they were piping me ashore. That's me and Debbie as I was retiring. And then here's our guest, David. So David was a chief. You could see him there in his khakis. And uh, he's rocking the dolphins there. That's his um, – That's is that dolphins? What do you call that? Yeah, those are dolphins for some okay. reason. Yep, yep. He was a submarine guy, and uh, there he is with a big bag of fish, and that's why <laughs> we got him on the show tonight. Uh, because it's the Chief's birthday, I wanted to. I had met him via Facebook a little while ago, a few years ago actually, on the Phoenix Bone Odor page, and uh, saw how good of a hammer he was. So I'm like, man, I need to have him on for the Chief show. So. Let me get rid of that. But uh, that's that's a little bit that I wanted to talk about, you know, with the chief birthday, why it's a big deal for us. And uh, so we're going to talk about the spawn with a retired Navy chief and a mash chief and Chris. So uh, let's see if anybody has, has piped in and said anything new. Yoder stepped in. Yeah, Yoder stepped in. He's yeah, like, sorry, man. I'm late. <laughs> david uh, he, david uh yoder came up with some taint pop and it's actually supposed to be pretty good from what i hear i don't yeah. know we'll <laughs> yeah but anyway <laughs> anyway let's get into the meat of the show and we're going to talk about the spawn and and uh one of the reasons why i wanted to have david on is because man he caught a bag last year um on and I, I was friends with him on Facebook, and I was like, "Man, David, talk to us about you know the spawn in the DFW area." Well, I'll go back to when you were at Key West. That was my first and my last submarine was the USS Key West. So, uh, oh yeah, be, be like a little thing down there in Key West about the submarine. But yeah, the the spawn it it, it just started kicking off here. Uh, it's probably been going on for a few weeks, but it we keep getting some crazy weather. So they want to move up, then they want to move back, then they want to move up, they want to move back. We keep getting cold mornings, and that's pushing them off. But um, it, it's uh, it's starting to get right. The days are getting a little bit longer, and uh, once we get a little bit more consistent weather, it's gonna be gonna be pretty much lightning lightning bolts going off because the fishing is gonna get really really good. Well, let me, you you brought up something I want to ask. Uh, and I'm I'm thinking that maybe some of the viewers might have that same question. Do you mean that the the bucks moved up and started fanning out beds, and then maybe the uh, the weather got bad and they pulled back out, or are you talking about the females pushing uh, up? There was a few bucks that moved up, and a couple females moved up. Um, I saw one about a week and a half, two weeks ago. I thought was 13, 14 pounds, maybe on a bed and, and, uh, I, I felt pretty confident I was going to be able to catch her, but, um, it was the first time that I've ever caught a buck and the female left and never came back. So, uh, every, every time I go fishing, yeah. I feel like a different learning experience. Uh, you know, 
like if you're not learning something when you're at the lake, you know, what are you doing? So even if you have a bad day at the lake, that's a learning experience, you know, and you know what not to do in a tournament or, uh, you know, you have a bad day at practice or whatever, you know, you know what not to do when the tournament happens. So, um, but yeah, a lot of the, there was a few bucks that moved up a couple females. Um, and then we had, we had a little bit of a warming trend here, it warmed up. Um, and then, we had some crazy weather that came in, cold front came in, it dropped it back down in the 40s. Um, the water temperature went from, you know, 63, 64, it dropped it back down to 58. And so when it does that, the fish don't know if they're coming or they're going. So they kind of move back out a little bit and they, they just wait for the wet weather to stabilize. So they might, you know, go hang out under a dock where you saw them, you know, pretty close to where you saw them or a tree or something to that effect, you know, wait till the weather gets right and then they move back up and do their thing. Nice, nice. Mm -hmm. Let let me uh, pull this picture back up, and uh, I want everybody to see it. And I want you to talk about this bag of bass that you caught. Yeah, so uh, it was a pretty – that was by, by far the best day of fishing I ever had. Uh, that bag was 43 pounds. That was two 11s, a 10, a 9, and a 4. Uh, couldn't get rid of the 4, so I apologize for that. But I tried all day. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I actually caught the, I actually caught the nine first and, and, uh, caught her actually pretty quick. I, I think when the spawn, you know, it's all about being able to read the fish and, um, being able to, to tell each one's little personality, you know, and you can tell pretty quick, you know, when you see one, whether or not that fish is going to bite, if that fish is not going to bite. And, um, it just was one of those days the moon was right. And uh, I caught the nine pounder and just said, well, I'm going to go looking. And I ended up coming across, uh, uh, I think I caught the four pounder. Well, it was crazy. I spent more time catching the four pounder than I did any of the other ones. Um, it took me probably 45 minutes to catch the, the four pounder. And each of the other ones, it took me less than five minutes to catch the others. So um, it happened pretty, pretty quick. But yeah, it was a pretty special day. I caught the two 11 pounders on back-to-back -back casts, actually. They were one dock apart from each other. And uh, I just, I happened to see the one. I thought, well, let me go check this other dock. There was a magical tree under one dock that's no longer there, unfortunately. But uh, that that particular tree, I caught uh, three fish over 10 pounds off of it that year on the during the spawn, three wow. different ones. And, um, and so I went to go check that tree, and there was an 11-pounder there. And I caught it on the first flip. And then I moved over to where the one I had just saw on the, on the other dock, and I caught it on the first cast, too. Wow. <clears throat> That's pretty cool. Yeah. Later on in the day, I, I found one that was right at 10. So it was a little two 11s, a 10 and 10, a nine and a four, four and a half. And I, I didn't have enough strength in my body to hold up the four pounder. That's all I could hold up was the four big ones. So <laughs> yeah. Were you, were you pitching and flipping? No, yeah. I have a little creature bait that I throw in the beds. Um, you know, I, I just, I think everybody has their own confidence and what they think works best for them, you know, and some people like to throw, uh, you know, white baits so, cause they can see them better. You know, I'm, I'm more of a natural guy. I like it to be a natural color, you know, when I'm fishing. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty magical day to say the least. Nice. Nice. Do you nice. care to share where you were? Uh, I was on possum kingdom. Oh, on possum kingdom. Okay. Yeah. And uh, guys, if you don't know where that is, that's uh, the west side of Fort Worth. Um, what is that? Interstate 20? It's north of Interstate 20? Yeah, it's just north of Interstate 20. About yeah. probably about 50, 60 miles west of Fort Worth. Yeah, yeah. They were uh, talking about Bassmaster Classic there. Um, I don't know if you watched when they were at the... Uh, I think they were at Lake Fork and they were talking about it. Uh, Davey Hyde actually mentioned something about their classics going to be at Ray Roberts, but they were hoping it was going to be at Possum Kingdom. Mm. Yeah, I heard him say that. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. man. I, Pretty much, like, <clears throat> you know, the, the Bassmaster Kayak Series has been there, I think, three times, and they're getting ready to come back in two weeks to, to try it again during the spawn. So, it should be pretty, should be pretty magical for them. Nice. Heck yeah. Nice. Well, uh, let me pull that down so we can get the pictures back up. And, uh, you know, t I don't know if everybody out there can see like I can, but, I mean, look at the mounts <laughs> he's got in the in his room there. Tell us about, oh, the, tell us about those fish. Uh, 
the one there, uh, I caught that one on, uh, on Headwaters Lake down in Florida when it first opened. Um, that was a pretty magical lake down there. Uh, my dad actually came down. It was my 38th birthday, actually. And um, we'd, had, we'd been there a few times before that. It opened. It was a magical place. Like, you could catch, I mean, it was not uncommon to catch 150 bass a day just because they built the lake. It was specifically made for bass fishing, and they didn't open it to the public for 10 years. So you can only imagine 10 years worth of bass in a lake, and, and then they open it up, and it's just, I mean, it was like fishing in an aquarium almost. But my dad came down for my 38th birthday. I caught that one right there on a buzz bait. She was 10 and a quarter. Oh, man. And then these two right here was uh, part of that picture um, uh, that you were just showing. There was the two 11s are, are those right there. I'm still going to that- get the other. Uh, the, the 10 done i just haven't had it done yet is that the uh, texas parks and wildlife uh, program where they they send you a replica y- yeah they have that if you catch a share lunker if you catch one over 13 uh i've never caught one over oh it's 13. over 13 okay gotcha. 13 and they have a, a banquet at the end of the year and then they give out a a replica of the fish you know to the angler that caught it but these ones i paid for myself so Oh, for catch one over 10 it's getting replica made and so i got another couple more to get done so yeah yeah i i have work to do <laughs> <laughs> now it's really cool man i like your old setup the, those bucks are awesome too man uh not just I, i'm a big symmetry guy i love symmetry so yeah i actually yeah. just picked those up today i just got them back from the taxidermist so it looks cool. Nice. Mine's, it look, mine's right here. <laughs> it looks great, by the way. Yeah. But uh, man, you know, it it the previous shows that me and Chris have done, you know, we've been spending a lot of time talking about, you know, mid strolling, sniping for bass, uh, you know, Demiki rigging, you know, whatever you want to call it. Basically, it's throwing a minnow bait at fish on live scope. But I, I feel, and, and the reason why I wanted to talk about on the show tonight with you and Chris was I think we're starting to get to the time when, you know, you can go to the bank, man, and, and start, you know, beating the bank. What are y'all's thoughts on that? Uh, I, I definitely agree. I fished a tournament on Saturday at Lake Barkley with a great friend of mine, Don Sanders, and it was on and I was scanning around, but we were flipping. And we caught them. I mean, we we had thirteen eighty seven. I think that put us in fourth. There was a thirteen ninety four for third, fourteen change for second, and uh, uh, first place was fifteen pounds. So we were all over it. We just never got a big bite, but we caught. Gosh, uh, well, we had those five. We culled, I think, five times, and caught another handful of of bucks that were keepers that just didn't do anything for us um but yeah we were all over it you know so uh not a single one of them caught looking at them though yeah so uh it's it it is coming it and the water temp was 62 63 maybe 64 towards the end of the day yeah and that was Um, on barkley that was on barkley Mm -hmm. okay has the asian carp messed that lake up uh, it has in the past, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's really hit or miss on that lake. It seems like, um, I've seen it on years where there's been carp all over the place. And then now it seems like they're very much stand out very much. Okay. And they haven't been working on Barkley quite as hard as they have Kentucky Lake, but, uh, and David, I don't know if you're familiar with those two, but. They're, they they run parallel. There's a canal that connects them, but um, they both come off the Ohio River, and the carp moved into the lake through the lock system. And it, those things, those things yeah, it, there we could we could talk all night about that, but or about Asian carp. Um, but they are absolutely a problem. They weren't the only problem, but it was a perfect storm of things that that happened all together. But um, there's still quite a few carp, but Jim, to answer your question directly, they, they do seem to be thinned out. Whatever is being done is working. Okay. And uh, I know for a fact Kentucky Lake has come 
way back. There was a tournament there, not to get off on another tangent, but there was a tournament there. I got to throw this out there. There was a Jetta Marine tournament on Saturday. The winning bag was 27 pounds, 10 ounces. And second and third were both 23 and change. And I know the guy that was in, I believe he was in 20th place and he had 15 pounds. So, oh, wow. yeah, that's, that's crazy weights for Kentucky Lake. That's like yeah. the Kentucky Lake 10 years ago before everything happened. So, yeah. uh, both Barkley and Kentucky Lake are coming back. Good, good. That's a, that's a good report for those, uh, who want to head that way to go fishing, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, I got to go to the, I'm fishing a BFL in Kentucky Lake this upcoming week. It's like, 27 pounds all right i got my workout out for me let's go let's do this <laughs> how long does it take you to get there from lebanon uh it's a good well it depends on where i go um to go to the upper end believe it or not is shorter it's right at two hours like two hours and five minutes to go to paris it's about two hours and 15 minutes so you know, yeah not, not terrible not yeah. terrible well at, that kind of segues into what i was going to tell david uh david are you fishing any uh tournament trails this year yeah i fish with, uh, i fish a few clubs and uh, several opens and then a uh, buddy of mine we're fishing the uh team trail outdoors here in texas it's probably one of the biggest biggest tournament trails here in texas um but uh they only fish uh they fish four tournaments and then a championship the fourth tournament's going to be on possum kingdom so we're pretty much looking forward to that in june um, and then I'll be fishing Lake Texoma on the championship in October. So we're looking forward to that. But other than that, I just fish a few club things and, uh, and then so, quite a few opens when they have them. Yeah. Back in, I think it was 2005. I think it was 2005 when I lived in Fort Worth, I fished the cowboy division of the BFLs and, uh, only one lake was within two hours of me. And that was Cedar Creek. Right. But all all the other lakes that we had to fish in the cowboy division, I mean, it was travel. Mm -hmm. I mean, we I think we fished Falcon, we fished wow. uh, right. Sam Rayburn, um, yeah. and then there was some other some other lake way out there. Uh, and I think we did Granberry. Granberry was pretty close. Yeah, Granberry. But, yeah, but man, it seemed like every time I had a tournament. You know, I had to take like a week's leave because <laughs> it was like, you know, six hours away. Falcon was a long drive away. That's like eight, nine hours. Yeah. I mean, it was crazy, but uh, uh, I had a good time there. I, I I was a better fisherman back then. I finished 17th that year and uh, the regional, I believe, was on uh, Lake Texarkana. Texoma? And, no, Texarkana. It's right on the state line. And, uh, man, it my trolling motor broke. <laughs> so, wow. yeah, you know, good. you know how that goes. Try, try to go bass fishing half a day with no trolling motor. Yeah, it's, it's, it sucked. It sucked. But anyway, I had a good time doing it. I burned a lot of leave and spent a lot of money that year. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I had a good time. That was the year that uh, BASS was doing these special tournaments where they would bring like 50 anglers in and do like a little special tournament that they would have to qualify for. And one of them was on Eagle Mountain Lake, which Eagle is Mountain. right there in Fort Worth. And uh, I, I remember going out there. I launched my boat, me and my son, and we followed Mike Iaconelli around. And uh, you know what he he did all day on that lake, David? He threw square bill crankbaits around all the boat docks. That's all he did all day long. I just fished a tournament there about a month ago, and that's all I did was throw a square bill crankbait around. <laughs> the dock. So yeah, seems like a pattern. Yeah, yeah. It must be the thing to do. Did and, you catch uh, him? Did uh, you catch him? Uh, I had the opportunity to win, but it was one of those days where if it could have went wrong, it went wrong, and. And, uh, but I, I lost a few, few big ones that, that could have won me the tournament, but that's, you know, that's what happens when you fish. So those days will happen. Well, I will tell you that lake is where I learned how to Carolina rig. Um, I didn't know how to do it before I moved out there. Cause my previous duty station before 
Fort Worth was New Orleans, uh, oh. Naval Air Station Bell Chase. And all you needed to do in the marsh was flip a black and blue jig and throw a spinnerbait. That was pretty much all you needed. Uh, maybe a baby minus one, if y'all remember that bait. Yep. Uh, that was about the only thing that you would need. And uh, I taught myself how Carolina rigged there. Uh, Shaky Head had just come out because Kevin Van Dam, I think, won a tournament up on uh, uh, what's that? Big, there's a big lake, Lake Louisville. Is Louisville yeah. a lake? He caught the yeah. record in that tournament. Yeah, yeah. And uh, here's a little cool thing. Uh, when bass came to town uh, for that shootout on Eagle Mountain Lake, they actually reserved the downtown performing arts center and had like a mini classic show. And oh. And my son won the casting kids contest. No, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so that that was that brings back some memories, man. Golly, that was twenty years ago. <laughs> but anyway, I really enjoyed my time in Texas, man. It was uh, I love that state. Uh, Texas Texans are proud to be Texas because you know you don't mess with Texas. And uh, I, you know I've always told my wife Debbie I was like if things go to crap here in Tennessee. I know where I'm moving. <laughs> and, uh, so I hope you heard that Eric and Michelle, if uh, something happens, man, I might move to East Texas, but uh, yeah, I, I, I really, the only thing that was kind of cool about Texas was everything that you want is an hour away. You know, if you live in the DFW area and what I mean by that, every store, Every restaurant in the world is within an hour of you. Well, when I joined the Navy in 2001, uh, I would have to say this place was it, – it's quadrupled in size since 2001. It's unbelievable how big this place is, especially the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. There's, there's like – seems to be like millions of people moving here. All over. There's houses where there used to be far as you could see fields. Oh, wow. But houses, so. Yeah. Which, uh, uh, I think COVID happened and everybody bought a bass boat because you know, that was a safe place to be. So now everybody wants to be at the lake, you know, during, especially during this time of year, everybody's at the lake. So it ain't uncommon to go to the lake and see, you know, a hundred boats at the lake. Yeah. yeah. Uh, who's your boat dealer down there? Uh, well, I actually bought my boat in, uh, in when I was in the Navy in uh, with Dowie, Alabama. And, okay. Uh, but I mean, our, our local one is uh fun and sun boats. Uh, Jeff Gilbert owns it over there in uh, Fort Worth. You yeah. know, they're a great group of people. You can go over there and buy uh, Phoenix, Skeeters, you know, whatever you need. They basically can get it for you. So uh, awesome. Well, great well, before Phoenix came out, when I lived there, I was a Ranger guy and Fun and Son was my dealer. Uh, Fane, I think, yep. was yep. one of the managers there. Yep. And, uh, he took care of me. Like when my trolling motor broke, I took the boat in there. Boom. He fixed it. You know, he oh, took yeah. care of me. Good dude. Yeah. You got, you can't be good customer service, you know, and, and uh, they, they, they get you in and out pretty quick. So that's always yeah. good. Yeah. Just like Nashville Marine here in middle Tennessee, man, if you got something you bring it in, boom, they, they get you knocked out, get you out of there. So two good Phoenix dealers out there, guys, I'm giving a plug for them both Nashville Marine and fun and son. There in the DFW area. Uh, here's a little story, man. If y'all don't mind me sharing, uh, I was fishing a club tournament on Cedar Creek Lake. You ever been to that lake, David? I, I've never been to Cedar Creek, no. Well, it was on Cedar Creek, and uh, it was my very first club tournament because I had just moved there from Louisiana, and I didn't know anybody. I mean, I'm talking zero. I went to the First meeting, I paid my dues. They said, we're going to Cedar Creek Saturday. See y'all at the launch. You know, I get down there. I'm, I'm fishing by myself. So I launch my Ranger. I take off. And I'm like, you know what? I'm like, the fish ought to be on the bed. So I started looking for beds, and I found them. And, I mean, I caught them. Nice. And I didn't catch them like you did, but I probably had, you know, 17 pounds. Uh, a lot of threes and a four and uh, came back to weigh in or weigh in was early for some reason. It was like a one o'clock beach, my boat, 
and I went to go get my truck and boat trailer. And guys, if you've ever been fishing in Texas, some of their boat ramps are very small for the parking area. I had to park up the street at a gas station in this gravel lot right beside it. So I pull out and I'm driving down the road and I stop because I want to turn left into the boat ramp because I had cars coming at me from across a bridge. And a drunk driver hit the back of my boat trailer. It broke the ball, went through my bed of my truck all the way up to my cab. And I mean, I'm talking it totally destroyed my boat trailer. Oh, God. And I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, luckily I had remembered, I saw an, a, a marina that was nearby. So I had, I missed weigh in, obviously. I released <laughs> all my fish. For good reason. Yeah. And uh, I motored over to this marina and luckily there was a, Hispanic gentleman there. And I was like, dude, I was like, can I pay you to park my boat here? And he's like, don't worry about it. And he, he lowered this thing. I pulled my boat up there. I told him the story. He lifted my boat out of the water. So I took my, back then I only had one graph. I had a Lawrence HDS. <laughs> I took it off and turned my batteries off and left. And he had a guy drive me all the way around to where my truck was. And uh, I tell this story because of this. This is what was cool. I call Thane up and I'm like, my boat trailer got totaled on Saturday. This is Monday morning. He's like, what do you need? And he's like, give me your serial number. I give him the serial number and a credit card and I was like, what? I need something to get my boat. You know, he's like, we're going to loan you a trailer. So I had to drive to his satellite place down in Granbury. I went down there, got a boat trailer, went down there, got my boat, got it home, and uh, ordered a new trailer. Of course, insurance paid it. But uh, yeah, it was a, I think I got a new trailer in four weeks delivered. But uh, Thane hooked me up, man. He allowed me to borrow a trailer, and I was appreciative of him for that. But that Absolutely. that's my biggest story from Texas. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. They're great people. Yeah. You need help. They're always there to help. So, Yeah. Uh, Chris, man, uh, what do you got coming up, you know, as far as tournaments? Man, I am slammed. So... This weekend, this upcoming Saturday, BFL at Kentucky Lake. Uh, the week after that, club tournament on Sunday at Old Hickory. And then the week after that, the Bass Nation State at Watts Bar, Saturday, Sunday. Um, home on Monday and then leaving Tuesday morning, heading to Pickwick. I'll be at Pickwick all week until Saturday. Friday, Saturday is the USA Bass and Nationals. And... I, I've got something until the middle of May. I can't even remember what 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 that is after, after USA Bassin. But uh, I think there may be – oh, I think there's another BFL at Kentucky Lake. The next one is May the 6th, I think. And uh, so, yeah, we're running right now. Yeah. We're, we're running. So – What do you uh, got coming up, David, down there in Texas? I got an open tournament this coming weekend. Uh, today was the, actually the anniversary from it last year and I had 31 pounds in it last year and won it. So hoping, hoping for a repeat of last year, this oh. coming Saturday, uh, the following weekend is our team trail outdoors up on Ray Roberts. Um, so that should be a slug fest up there for that because the fish will be spawning there. So it'll be a slug fest going on there. Um, I got another open tournament on Possum Kingdom on the 27th, um, Oh, yeah, on the 14th, I'm the camera boat for Bassmasters kayak deal here on Boston Kingdom. So I'm going to be taking the camera guy around on the on Sunday, the 14th, to get some video and some pictures going on for the kayak leaders on Bassmasters. Uh, I then, bet that'll be fun. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it should be a good time. Like I said, 27th, I got an open tournament. And then the beginning of May, I got a two-day tournament up on Lake Texoma uh, back then. And then I think – 
I can't remember what, what the tournament is and the next one after that is, but quite a few of them, pretty much every weekend I'm fishing a tournament. So somewhere. Yeah, they stack them in here from March till the end of May or mid June, yeah. don't they? <laughs> yeah. What about you, Jim? What do you have coming up? Uh, the only BFL that I'm signed up for is old Hickory in June. Um, I'm not going to fish Tim's Ford or center Hill. Um, I'm focusing on content. I'm going to start making a lot of videos. That's going to be my deal. Um, I don't know. I've, I've been thinking about going up to Dale hollow to watch the bass pro tour, uh, maybe do some filming. Uh, I'm, I'm really not sure about that. Um, the only th what put the kibosh on it is that uh, day one, which is when I needed to be there, uh, my dad needs me for a project at his house. So, you know, family comes first, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah. I got to do that. But um, I, I'm really not as far as tournaments. I think I've, there's a there's an open coming up here on Old Hickory Lake in two Saturdays. Um like uh, Two Rivers Ford or something like that. I'm thinking about jumping in. And then, of course, we got the uh, Mount Jewett for Hope coming up pretty soon. Uh, that's sponsored by Nashville Marine that I plan on jumping in. But uh, that, that's about all I got going. I'm going to I'm going to focus more on some YouTube content this spring. Uh <laughs> What my dream is, is I'm wanting to find them on the beds and I'm going to make a bed fishing video. That's what I want to do. Uh, well, make it happen. <laughs> yeah. How I'll, long uh, where you guys are from? Say again? How long does the spawn last? Like when does it begin and when does it end where you guys live? Well, it, it, it depends on the lake. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like Old Hickory, we, we talked about this before. If you look at the maps over my shoulder – Old Hickory's the one on the bottom, uh, right there where my thumb is. That's where the dam is, and then that end is the river that goes up to um, Cordell Hall and Dale Hollow and all that. What what happens is that the cold water comes down, so they actually spawn on the lower end first. Yeah, versus right. the oh. upper end. So you can catch spawning fish in June. Here on Old Hickory. I, well, I I wish I shared. I think it was last week or week before when we were kind of touching on this. I I I won a tournament last year in July, and I kid you not, I caught them on bed. I believe it. Now I couldn't yeah. see them, and there are also there were also fry garters that I caught as well. But you know, I caught them on bed, and uh, you know, it was in the middle of July. Yeah, makes no sense. Hey, Gavin's checking in. Hey, Hammer, what's up, bro? Yeah, the biggest bass I ever caught was in the middle of June, and and, and she was on a bed in about eight, nine foot of water. And uh, I caught an eight-pounder that day in her, and she was right at 12. So. What um, what do you, do you know or remember what the moon phase was when you caught those fish? Ah, man, I don't remember, but I want to see. It seems to remember that the, it was like a full moon, or it was either a full moon or a dark moon, you know, one of those two, but. I remember it was shocking to me that I found those two, you know, those fish. Cause I was like, as warm as it was, the water temperature was up there. It was in the high seventies, almost 80. Yeah. And uh, they were still on beds, you know, which was, it wasn't a many, there wasn't many, but the two that I found, they were, they were giants. So. I, I don't know if this applies to your particular situation where, when, when and where you caught those fish, but years ago I saw this or heard this on tactical bass and, and they swore up and down that, that the first full moon in June, you'll catch a big fish if you just go fishing. Well, that was a big one for sure. Um, yeah, so so if you're fishing on that full moon in June, then you'll you'll catch a big one. So that's why I asked that question. I wasn't sure if maybe but, you know, that was I a possibility. All the time is like, well, you know, a lot of people think that the fish only spawn once, you know. And, no, uh, no. Last year, I caught a fish, um, and how I know this is the same fish because she had a black mark on the side, left side of her head, and I caught that fish in the, about the third week of March, and she was eight and a half pounds, and uh, I caught her, took her to a weigh-in, and I took her back to exactly where I caught her, let her go, 
And a month later, I caught her on another bed with a different buck about 10 feet away from the where I caught her a month earlier. Same fish. So oh, wow. People, <laughs> people don't realize, you know, you spawn multiple times. And uh, I just, I mean, that that particular fish, like I said, she had black markings on the side of her head. So it made it very obvious that that was the same fish, you know, looking at her in the water. But yeah. Uh, it was pretty cool to see that you know that fish it, you know she at least spawned twice you know mm -hmm. so well uh i think it was last week we were talking about this and i'd like to ask your opinion david on this and um uh, jim i may be jumping ahead i don't know but go um, ahead yoder asked a question earlier about the moon and water temp and which one so what i was saying for me and what i've seen is there's four factors that that make the fish spawn and so ultimately the question is what makes the fish spawn? Well, for me, it's, it's the moon phase, it's water temperature, it's day length, and then water level. And no one of those four is an overriding factor over anything else. It's almost like uh, a percentage. If there's two or three of those that align and that's yeah. what makes the fish go. Absolutely. Um, but, but you know, are any of them that one thing? No, but what, What's your opinion on that? No, I would agree with that. Uh, I know a lot of people think it's the full moon that causes them to move up first. Uh, I actually prefer a dark moon. Um, I think they spawn, you get just as many or more on a dark moon than you will on a full moon. Um, it's just that gravitational pull that it just aligns for the fish on the earth, you know. But once the water temperature gets right, like that's kind of like we're, we're dealing with here. It, you know, it goes up, it goes down. You know, of course, you're going to have some fish. Uh, you know, I, I've always... I've always thought, you know, they spawn in the, you know, low to mid 60s, um, but I've seen them spawn in 55 degree water. So, uh, you know, I don't I, like I said it, earlier, I think it's a learning experience. Every time I go, it's like sometimes you're just like, wow, I can't believe that there's a fish spawn in the 55 degree water, you know, and you're looking down at an eight pounder with a three pound buck, you know. So mm -hmm. I think like you said, when things line up right, two or three things line up at the exact right moment, you know, they do their they make their push to the bank and. And, um, you know, it may not be every fish in the lake cause they go in yeah. waves, you know, there's going to be a few that move up earlier than, and then there's going to be a few that come later, you know, but probably the majority of them are probably going to spawn in the month of April, beginning of May, but you're going to have some in the beginning of March and, and in June, you know, provided the weather's right, temperature's right and the moon's right. Yeah. I think it's, it's a relative, um, the, everything that we just discussed is relative because, you know, down where you are, obviously the water temps are going to warm up faster and so on and so forth. The moon's going to be the same as what it is for us here in middle Tennessee, but the day length for both of us is going to be the same, All right? It's still April 1st for you today, as much as it is for us. So the day length may not be the most uh, predominant factor, I guess, in, in that particular scenario. Um, but also if you look at like a Highland Reservoir, uh, for us, it's the Dale Hollow, Center Hills, things like that. Um, I know there's Highlands in Texas as well. I think Travis is one, maybe. But anyways, um, those lakes tend to warm up slower than, say, some of your shallower lakes that that uh, maybe have uh, warmer uh, feeder lakes feeding into them. And the whole system will warm up um, uh, much faster on those lakes as opposed to a Highland. So... Yeah. Then on a highland, you don't have the the warm water as as soon. So it's uh, and then you've got lakes like for us on the TVA system that they bring them all the way up to full pool, and but it may take till the end of April, early May until that happens. And I I feel like fish know they they know it, it that hey we're not there yet. So. Yeah funny you you bring that up like uh in february we had a pretty good warming trend here and you got possum kingdom and you got granberry and the only thing that separates the two is a river and they're only about probably 50 miles apart from each other but granberry water temperature was five degrees warmer than it was on possum kingdom you know so uh you know it got up to close to 60 in february on the water in it in granberry and and it got everybody thinking like oh possum kingdom's got to be that it wasn't it was like 55 you know, 54. And, uh, and so, uh, yeah, it's kind of what you're saying. It's crazy that those two lakes are literally what is 
a river apart. I mean, they're 50 miles apart from each other. And one of them, Grand Prairie is a lot shallower and a little bit dirtier lake, so it definitely will warm up faster. But it was unbelievable that it was five, six degrees warmer than it was at Possum Kingdom, just 50 miles away. But Possum Kingdom is a really relatively, you know, usually it's a clear lake and it's a lot deeper lake. It's 100 feet in some places, so uh, it takes a little bit longer for it to warm up, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I hear Chris, just so that you can relate, uh, Possum Kingdom is kind of a mix between Center Hill and Dale Hollow. So would it be uh, like Priest? Kind of, yeah. Uh, Granberry is like Old Hickory Lake. It's the closest thing to Old Hickory Lake. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's stumpy, dirty, Yeah, you know. Just a river, river lake. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. It's not very wide. It's pretty much just a river that's dammed up, you know. Mm -hmm. not very yeah. wide. I, yeah, I'll, I wanna, I'll uh, oh, go ahead. I, I want to address a couple of things in the chat and then we'll get back to you, Chris. Okay. Uh, I don't want people to think that we're not paying attention to the chat. Uh, Wade, no, I haven't been up to Center Hill, so I, I did not see if anybody was up there. No, I, uh, well, I saw him on Facebook. He came up and fished a Good Friday tournament that was open, this open tournament out of, uh, um, I want to say I was out of Sligo, maybe. But oh, he wow. he and Hunter Shryock came and they uh they kind of made an opening to the tournament. I don't know how they did, but they said, "Yeah, I don't think we fished this lake but one time." Oh, cool. So. And then Michael, I know you fished up up there, Chris. Any tips on Lake Cumberland? Uh, well, I guess my first question back to you, Michael, is: Do you have a a, a forward facing sonar or not? Um, that lake is very dynamic in that it, uh, in the upper end of it and in the backs of some of the major creeks, um, uh, there is quite a few buck bushes, but they also raise and lower the water. So if the water's in the bushes, they're going to be close to spawning in that stuff, just like on a Kentucky Lake or, um, any of the other lakes. Uh, but if not, then they're going to be probably on the, secondary points on the way back or or somewhere close i i would this time of year where we are on april 1st the the thing to do I, I can't tell you where they might be but i can tell you what i would do is i would start in the back and start working my way out and because they're going to be closer to the back than they are going to be to the mouth or on the main river so um start in the back and start start working your way out find a uh, I don't know how to describe it, a, a shorter pocket or a uh, a shorter creek, so to speak. Start in the back, start fishing your way out, whether you're scoping or throwing a crankbait down the bank, something like that, something you can cover water with, and eventually you'll start catching a few fish and you can kind of determine about where they are. But yeah. this time of year, we're, we're in April, so I would start yeah. in the back and work my way out. Yeah, Michael, I see where you said you're a co uh, if you go back to last uh, two weeks ago's dialed in live, we talk about exactly what to do as a co angler if your boater is using forward facing sonar. Mm -hmm. So go back and watch dialed in live two weeks ago where we address that kind of stuff, man. Uh, I don't want to let this show get taken over by that because we did a whole show on it, man. So just go back on my, my channel, big Jim fishing, click on live and go back a couple of weeks. You can look at the thumbnail and tell where we talked about using forward facing sonar. And we, all three of us address uh, what we did or what we would do with our co-angler to help them out. Yeah, great question. Pre appreciate you reaching out about that. But that is a topic right now, and and uh, we we tried to go in as in depth as we could. Yeah, we got Mike in the house. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. A member of team dialed in, and we got another member who just tuned in. Bob Freeman is a big contributor to the channel. <laughs> Thank you, Bob, for tuning in tonight. And Mike's like, thanks, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so cool, cool. Yeah, man. Hey, you know, guys out there that you're new to watching Dialed In Live or to Big Jim Fishing, go to my channel on Big Jim Fishing. 
you know, I have, if you click on videos, every video I've made's on there, you click on live, there's 45 live streams that we've done that we address various topics that you can watch, or you can click on playlists. And then I have playlists built. Like if you, if you don't know anything about a Phoenix boat, I got a playlist that if you watch those videos, you're going to know everything about a Phoenix boat, all the models, what the different model numbers and stuff mean. Uh, also hummingbird electronics, uh, my new series coming up, we're going to be talking about Garmin electronics. So, you know, <laughs> this year, this spring, uh, I'm, I will be adding a lot of content on using your electronics, whether it be your Hummingbird VX map, side imaging, down imaging, forward facing, live scope, all that stuff. So we're uh, y'all look forward to that coming up in the future. But please utilize those playlists that I built for you guys to make it easy to find the content that you're looking for. All right. Well, um, or can I ask David a question? Yeah, yeah go. Ready to, yeah, so, go. so David, I, I've, I put a lot of thought into this over the years, but I'm curious what your take is on it. What do you consider a spawning pocket? I mean, is there a set of guidelines that you are focusing on to say, if you're looking at a map when you're going to a new lake, say, mm, yeah, I need to go check that or I need to go do this and so on and so forth. What defines a spawning pocket to you? Well, that's a pretty good question. Uh, man, when I, when I look at them here, I, you know, I, I, here, I like to fish where I, the fish have access to deep water the quickest. So like the, the, the pockets that are a little bit deeper than the, the shallower ones, um, are, are usually the ones that I like to look for. Um, I, it's definitely got to have a hard bottom. You know, like if you got a muddy bottom, you're not going to have fish up in there. So you need something with a hard bottom. Um, are, there, are there any indicators that you see that say, hey, this is the hard bottom other than feeling around or using your electronics? I usually use my electronics to look around. Uh, you know, I think, it, you know, Possum Kingdom has a lot of rocks, you know, and stuff like that. It's big rocky bottoms. So, you know, the fish will spawn on those rocks. They'll fan their beds on there. Um any, anything that's is uh it's got a hard bottom but i mean i try to stay away from the muddy pockets like if i know it's going to be a muddy bottom i go in there and mess around and you know it's real muddy i i try to stay away from those areas i i try to really focus on the, the pockets that have the hardest bottom because i know for a fact the fish will spawn in there so, yeah whether they're there today or yeah they might <laughs> or not they, they're they going to be in there at some point i guess yeah right and you know i kind of bring up another thing talking about like they may not be here today I mean, I, I've gone through pockets before and not, you know, seen one or two fish, came back five hours later and there's 30 fish on beds. You know, the fish you didn't even see five hours ago that weren't even there are now on beds. So it's amazing, like, how fast it can happen, you know, and people don't realize. I don't even get too worked up in fishing tournaments. Um, I feel like a lot of guys will catch a buck and then they just leave. Um, and, you know, you might be coming along. 30 minutes, an hour after they caught that fish and the female pulled up, you know, and really in all honesty, you want to catch the female only because five of those goes a lot longer than a five bucks. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing like how quick it can happen, you know, but I, like I said, I, I try to stick to stick to the pockets where I know that are, I got a much harder bottom and the, and the fish have access to some deeper water. Cause if the weather gets crazy in a deeper pocket, they don't go very far. Whereas if it's a really shallow pocket, they got to go all the way back. If the water temperature drops two, three, four degrees, they might travel a few hundred yards to get back out to water that's more comfortable and acclimated for them. You know, whereas in a deeper pocket, they may only go, you know, 20, 30 yards off the bank, but just be suspended or closer to the bottom and, it'll, you know, 10 foot of water, vice having to swim 300 yards to find 10 foot of water, mm -hmm. you know. Well, do you, when they slide back like that, do they typically sit on the bottom or do they relate to some piece of structure or cover? I think it really has to do with the, with the, uh, the pressure. You got high pressure, the fish usually go. I found that they get really tight to cover, you know, so they, you'd be on a, on a pole dock, you know, pole on a dock or a rock or a tree. They just get really tight to cover. 
you know, when it, we get those high pressure days, like a day after a cold front or something like that, mm-hmm. you know, it really tight to cover. So that's usually where I usually find them. And so then you, your approach to try to catch those fish changes to that yeah. scenario as opposed to shallow pitching at them yeah. or, or higher. Yeah. You're, you're going from bed fishing to now you're fishing a lot slower. You know, me you might make five or six casts to the same spot, you know, before you get that fish to bite. Um, you know, they're going to be real tight to cover. So in a way it, it kind of sucks. Cause it's like, man, it's the day after a, a you know, cold front, but in a, in another way, it kind of really positions them to a certain spot and you know exactly where to, where to cast to get bit. So, and having forward facing sonar does help for that. You can see them on a pole dock or, you know, suspended up under a dock or on a tree or whatever. So, or heck just suspended out in the middle in the upper water column. I mean, catch them on a jerk bait. I mean, this yeah. is a catch them on a jerk bait so um you know you, you you're always going to have pre-spawn and post-spawn and you can catch them on a jerk bait pretty much from now until june at least you know catching them out on secondary points or main lake points you know or even hell even in pockets i mean you saw what happened at lake fork they were catching them on jerk baits in there when the fish were up on bed some of them were out still suspended so you know they were catching them on jerk baits so that's usually what i do i throw a jerk bait around when i'm looking for them on beds in between looking for them I got a question for you, David. <clears throat> Actually, I want you to tell us a story, man. Uh, tell tell the viewers out there about the military tournament that you won back in Florida. Yeah, so it was like two years ago. Actually, uh, I actually found out about it on my last shore duty uh, when I was stationed in Georgia um, that they do a military fishing tournament. It's annual every single year. Um, it's, it's open to the active duty and to the retired, uh, the retired folks doesn't have to be both guys in the boat. It could be one and then you could take a friend or, you know, a family member or whatever. Um, but yeah, the first year we fished it, a buddy of mine, he lives in Florida. Uh, we came in, uh, I think it was 10th place. Uh, and then the next year we went, COVID happened a year or two and then they didn't do it. And then the next year, which was two years ago, we went and did it and we ended up winning it. Um, so two days of practice, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday is the tournament. So uh, makes for a fun week to get out of work. You know, if you're active duty or whatever, you get to go on TAD orders there. Um, there's a great guy, uh, uh, Richard Bates. He's a, a retired Coast Guard captain, and uh, he's the one that puts it on. Um, he Well, he runs it pretty much. And um, But, yeah, it was a good time. Uh, you know, that particular tournament uh, – you know, we caught all of our fish all three days off of beds um, down in Lake Kissimmee. Um, we had some fish found in Kissimmee, a couple found in Lake Cypress. That that, that tournament happens every year on uh, the Kissimmee chain. So you got Lake Toho, Lake Kissimmee, uh, Cypress, and Lake Hatchinaw. And, um, but we had found some fish in Kissimmee, and we went straight to them on the first day. And uh, I think we had like 20 something, 23 pounds, something like, nah, yeah, 23, 24 pounds. Then the second day, we had like right around the same 25, 26. And then the last day, we think we had 19 and we ended up pulling it off um, for the, for that particular tournament. But we caught all of our fish on beds um, all out of one spot. So the spot was like maybe a couple hundred yards long, but all the fish were, you know, they were all in that one little area, had a really good hard bottom. There was a lot of grass in the area and had a really good hard bottom. And the fish were, would be in these little pockets, you know, in, in the grass, and uh, we would push pull around, you know, it's one of those things, one of those places where running the trolling motor, it makes a lot of noise in the grass. So it's a lot easier to just pick the trolling motor up, pick the motor up, push pull around. And, uh, you know, when you find one on a bed in a hole, you know, you can drop the power poles and start fishing for it without making a lot of noise. Because by the time you get to them with the trolling motor running, you know, they've done left and you can't see them. Either, even though they're still going to be there, you're not going to see them because they go into the grass and while you're going over the top of them. So. But, um, yeah, it worked out pretty good for us um, in that particular tournament. Yeah. You ever plan on going back? Yeah. So we, we were hoping to go back this year. Um, uh, he, he and I both had some stuff that came up that uh, kind of prevented us from going back down there. I enjoy going. It's a fun tournament. Uh, it's a great group of guys. You know, there's people from all branches of the military, you know, Coast Guard, Navy, um, Marines, Army, everybody. And they come from all over, you know, people – from California, Alaska, Virginia. I mean, people come from all over to fish it. It's a lot of fun. Um, they have some pretty good sponsorship uh, stuff going on. People give out 
guide trips and they got some uh, sponsorship, you know, for rods and tackle and stuff like that, that they give out at the tournament. So it's pretty cool to see the military guys get, you know, a little bit of a, you know, good deal, you know, for coming down there and fishing for a week. It's, it's a cool little week off, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to try to go to it next year. You know, it's a little bit of a drive, you know, talking about a drive. It's a long drive from here to there. It's about 19 hours, 20 hours to get to Lake Kissimmee from here. So, but um, I look yeah. forward to it. I go uh, last year when I went year before last, I went down state at my buddy's house and I pretty much just fished the St. John's river, uh, um, headwaters, um, that the, the, all the different little lakes there in uh, Florida down there. So it was, it got real cold here. It was icy. I just wanted to go to Florida where it was sunny, where I could <laughs> catch bed and fish. So that's pretty much why I went down there. Cool. Michael's got a question for you, Chris. I'm fishing the LBL this weekend without giving up too much juice. Are they shallow yet? Uh, well, uh, first off, I don't have any juice, man. <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't do very well in the last one. Um, so, I, I the one thing I will tell you about Kentucky Lake is those fish relate to current. And they can, and they can be shallow 365 days a year. And now that may be on a main lake river bar and they pull up to feed. Um, but it, it, it could shallow could be on, on the main river channel as opposed to shallow in a pocket. Now, the thing that I'm going to try to determine in, in practice is which one of those two is going to be the, uh, the best player and then go from there. However, one thing to pay attention to is we, so this front that we have moving through tomorrow and Wednesday is severe. I mean, we're, I think the low on Wednesday night going into Thursday is 33 here. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it should. And then all day Thursday, we have a 15 mile per hour north wind. I think it's uh, north northwest, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, yeah, all the indicators there, like David said, it should, it should, all the indicators are there that it should push them back. Now, what that does two days after the fact, I don't know. That remains to be seen. But, um, you know, Kentucky Lake, especially where we're putting in at up in Moores, it's a, it's kind of one-dimensional. They're either on the main lake river bars or they're in a pocket. There's nothing in between. There's not very many large creeks or anything like that. I could count them on one hand how many there are. There's just not hardly any. So it should narrow it down a little bit. and. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. When when you go practice up there, do you come back every day? I will on Thursday, and then I have a place to stay on Friday night in okay. Paris. Paris is – it's about 50 minutes away where my friend lives there, but that's a heck of a lot closer than two hours, and um, I can, you know, at least get, get a little bit more sleep on that, that Saturday morning. Cool. Well, Wayne, who's a member of Team Dialed In, he says that Priest was hot over the weekend. I was catching them staging next to the flats. Guys were bed fishing. <laughs> I went shallow on the flats, but the water was too stained for me to see any beds. And then he follows up, how do you find the beds in stained water? Um, I, I'm not very experienced or, or good at bed fishing. So David, you want to take that one? <laughs> uh, well, stained water, it, it's like just clear water. The fish are going to spawn on some sort of structure. So, you know, if you, if you can find a, a tree or lay down or a rock or, you know, a dock pole, um, something to that effect, that's what the fish are going to spawn on. Um, you know, when you're trying to, you know, you can locate them with a spinner bait or a chatter bait or something to that effect. But when they're on the uh, on the beds in a little bit stained water, you know, it, it does make it difficult to see them. And the thing about bed fishing is you miss it by a foot. You know, you're not going to get bit. You know, it's uh, you know, you, you you cast one foot to the right or to the left of where the bed is. And, you know, even in clear water, they just stare at it, you know. But when you hit it perfect dead on right where they want it to be, you know, it's uh, you know, they hit it, you know. 99% of the time. So, 
it, it can be difficult in the stained water because you just got to be a lot more thorough, I guess you should say. You got to be a lot more thorough and make a lot more casts, you know, because you just really can't see them. Now, I will say this. Forward-facing sonar has definitely changed the game with bed fishing. You definitely can put your trolling motor in some landscape mode or your, your transducer, I mean, in some landscape mode and, uh, and you know, where you're looking like this and you can see them uh, on beds. Uh, it makes makes fishing a lot easier when you can look and say, well, I can't see them with my eyes, but I can see them on my graph. And <laughs> uh, so with that being said, you mentioned a chatterbait. Uh, uh, the idea is to use baits that cover water that you can make a lot of casts and reel in as opposed to something slow that you're dragging on the bottom trying to find them. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. It just It's so much harder in, in a little bit stained water. You know, it's a lot easier to cast than <laughs> baits, but... You know, you can't catch them with a with a, when it's stain like my home lake here, little lake here. You know, when the water stain, it's a lot slower. It's a lot slower presentation. But if you're flipping like a like a baby brush hog or something like that, and like a South African special, a dark color, you know, you want it to be something dark so they can see it. But uh, uh, usually, that's what you know r what works for me, anyways. And yeah. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is uh, I like to throw a wacky rig worm to get fish to identify themselves that, you know, are on the beds. Cause sometimes you can get them to strike that bait. And if you don't get a hookup, you will have an area that you got bit in that, you know, you could flip Absolutely. a creature bait or something like that as a follow-up. Absolutely. We use what, glide here. I was going to say, what about glide baits? Yeah. yeah glide baits a lot. So you may, they may not bite. A lot of times they will bite it, but a lot, they will show themselves. And, uh, they might follow it to the boat, and, and and if you see them, you know where you know it's time to you know s slow down, start really picking the area, and find where it came from. And usually, you know, it's, you can find where that area where the fish came from, or if it came off a bed. But uh, usually, you put something like a top water or a, uh, a glide bait or something to that effect near the bed. Okay. They're they're gonna show themselves. Yeah, that's one of the things that I'm wanting to try out in the next couple of weeks is. I'm going to turn my transducer to, uh, you know, perspective mode yep. and uh, see how that works out. I, I haven't done it yet, but uh, I'm going to try it. It's Have you done it? Water, so. I was playing with it on Saturday at Barkley. Um, I still have a Mega Live on a turret on the target lock, and I was playing with it on that. And mm. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, we'll see. We will see. Uh, David, what you mentioned glide baits. Do you have any particular favorite glide baits? Yeah, I throw a uh, – I got a buddy of mine, uh, my buddy of mine named Colton. He makes one. It's called Green Leaf Lures. He makes a zigzag. It's a pretty good bait. It's got a real tight uh, wobble to it. Um, I like a Gancraft. You can buy those off a of Tackle Warehouse, a Gancraft. It's a 178. Um you know, you just want something that slow sink that just got a real wide, wide. I don't, th this time of year, I don't really like to chop it too much. I just really like that real wide, real wide glide. And um, they really, right, right, right when the spawn's about to go on until look right after them. I mean, the glide bait is definitely the way to go. You can catch some big fish on it. Yeah, but in practice, you can use it as your search bait to identify where they are and then, you know, yeah. come back and, and fish for them, whatever. I, I put the trolling motor down. I usually don't even pick a rod up. You know, I, I search all day long. Trolling motor on eight, just going. So, I, you know, uh, you know, the power pole charge. You know, those type of systems where you can charge your trolling motor battery while your big motor's running. I feel like that's like a game changer, especially during this time of year, because you know you may be looking all day and you could just crank your motor up even while you're you know and just leave the the boat idling and it'll charge your trolling motor battery while you're searching trying to find some fish for a tournament. Nice. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Well, guys, uh, any, any more things y'all want to discuss? I'm, we, I can go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, someone mentioned, you know, how to find, you know, beds in stained water. And all, all I can say is that the more, you know, I'm an old school bank beater, you know, I flip jigs, I say flip. I really don't flip. Flipping is when you pull the line out and all that. I pitch jigs, okay? I pitch jigs a lot. I know how to skip them. 
Um, I do creature baits, you know, that kind of thing. And I also do a, a wacky rig uh, to help get them to show themselves or something like that in stained water. But the key is to me, you know, a, a lot of guys get so wrapped around having different colors or whatever. If you're in stained water, it is hard to beat black and blue guys uh, out there. You know, Wayne, if, if you're in some stained water, it's hard to beat black and blue. Play, array, play around with different kinds of trailers on your jig. Or if you're, you know, pitching a creature style bait, play, away, play around with different uh, profiles. You know, uh, he mentioned like a, a baby brush hog or, you know, maybe go to like a beaver style, try that. Sometimes even a tube is deadly when you're pitching around. I know Chris didn't want me to say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But I mean, there there's some other things that I like to pitch around. <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna give up a little juice. Uh people have been asking for some juice on bed fishing. And 90% of the people out there would never do this. But if you're ever out fishing shallow water and you know that fish might be moving on beds, try this one time and get back with me. Rig up a drop shot that's about that long, you know, about eight or nine inches. Rig up a drop shot and try a fluke bait on it. Uh, try wacky, wig, uh, wacky rigging a uh, Senko style bait on it and start pitching that around. You know, uh, some, some people called it bubba shotting, uh, which bubba shotting is like drop shotting, but you use a bait caster and you use a little bit heavier weight, a uh, little bit bigger lines. That's uh, an Alabama thing. I think they call it bubba shotting. You ever done that, Chris? I have not. Yeah. Well, it, it's one of the, one of my tools I keep in, in my arsenal for when I know that they're moving shallow. Sometimes, you know, when the bait is up off the bottom, they're going to hit it because they think maybe it's a bluegill or something getting around their bed. But it, it, it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes that bait has to get right in the sweet spot of their bed. You know, you could be on one side of the bed and they don't care. They won't even look at it. You'll see them. They'll just circle around, circle around. But then there's like a little sweet spot. And if you get it in there, all of a sudden you're just going to see their nose go down right like that. And that's when you know that you're doing something right. You know, uh, back in, I think it was mid-2000s, 2011, somewhere in that time frame, I ended up marshalling for the Bassmasters. And I, on the second day, I drew Gerald Swindle. And um, I thought it was like, you know, it was, a, it was a pretty cool learning experience. It was on the St. John's River, but he was using a drop shot to catch fish off beds. And, uh, you know, I'd never even thought of such thing, you know, back then. And, and so, so to be able to watch it and – you know, see him catch fish off beds. I was like, okay, it's a little little tool I could put in my tool belt, you know what I mean, for bed fishing. So, yeah, definitely a drop shot, This, you know, around the spawn. A lot of times I'll throw a drop shot way out in front of the boat just fishing and just work it like a worm as I'm looking for beds, and you'll, you'll be amazed at what you catch just doing that. Yeah. Rick uh, brought up something, y'all. He fishes the Harris chain, so he fishes for him shallow all the time. And he brought up a, a tip for you viewers out there. Ne never give up the dead sticking. Sometimes a dead stick bait, you know, you throw it in there, don't move it or anything. Sometimes that'll generate a bite. So uh, way to bring that up there, Rick. Yeah. Like I said earlier, I think when bed fishing, it all comes down to the personality of the fish. Every single fish is different. And you really got to pay attention to how that fish reacts to when you cast. If you cast into a bed and that fish swims off 30, 40 feet, that is not a catchable fish. That fish, and it takes that fish two or three, four or five minutes to come back to the bed, you might as well just leave. You're yeah. wasting your time. You know, if you go by a bed and the fish that sits there in the bed and just stares at you as you go by and doesn't move, you can turn the boat around and start casting as you're about to catch that fish. You know, so it's all about the personality and you can learn real fast when you start throwing on the ones that you can see whether or not that fish is going to bite or not. Yeah. What keys are you looking for when you 
No, other than the fish sitting there looking at you. Uh, mainly it's like, hey, is that fish going to swim off? How, how far, if it does swim off, how, how far away does it go? You know, if that fish only goes three or four feet from the bed and turns around, that, that's probably a fish you're going to catch because they're real tight in the garden, the bed. If that fish is going to swim 30, 40, 50 feet away and you're like, man, where did it go? Um, it's going to take it several minutes to get back. That fish is a lot spookier. It could have had, you know, already 20, 30 people throw at it. Or, um, you know, that fish is just a lot more spookier. And it's a, it, it may be a lot more, uh, you know, cognizant of the baits that have been thrown at it. So it doesn't want to bite anything. So uh, I try to find the ones that, you know, that fish is locked on. The boat, I, I mean, I like it when the boat goes right over the bed and the fish doesn't even move. And you look off the other side of the boat as the boat went over and it's still sitting there. Like, you you, you know that, hey, hey I this fish is going to bite. You just you get you get the bait into the sweet spot and it and that fish is gonna bite no doubt. But if the fish swims off, I just keep the trolling motor going. If, you know if they're gonna swim 30, 40 feet away from the bed and hang out there for a minute or a couple minutes before they come back, that's just a waste of your time because you're gonna cast in there and it's gonna do the same thing again. Mm -hmm. Does it make a difference if there's two fish on there versus one? If you got a male and a female? Yeah, so I won a tournament a couple weekends ago. Uh, preferably if both you know if both of them are right there on the bed you know it, ideally you want to catch the female first um you know so if you can see them together you know i mean i got lucky in that tournament i ended up winning it and i caught the females that i saw with the buck sitting there um before i ever caught the buck you know but ideally that's what you want to do is to catch the female first um you know like i told you that story earlier i mean a lot a lot of times you catch the buck and you're like put them in a live well and then the female pulls up there and she, you know, she locks onto the bed and now she's guarding it. So, you know, then it becomes, it might take 15, 20, 30 minutes for that to happen. But, um, you know, if you can see her in the area, you know, and she's not really swimming too far, she's going to swim up there eventually. Um, but, you know, the, like I said, that one I had the other day, it was a monster. It would have been the biggest one of my life. And I mean, I couldn't believe it. I caught the bug, put him in the live well and about 10 minutes goes by and I'm like, where did this female go? Like she was ginormous. You couldn't miss her. She looked like a well in the water. Yeah. And she swam off and never came back. And I thought, man, this is crazy. I even let the buck go. And I was like, well, I'll give it a couple hours. And I come back, I came back nowhere to be found. So like, that was the first time I'd ever had that happen to me that a female like literally just left and never came back. So. Wow. Yeah. I I, I love all the different bed fishing stories, man, because <laughs> it, like he's, like he said that, you know, everyone's different, you know, uh, you know, guys, uh, let's see, Wayne, like you asked earlier about fishing in stained water, you know, sometimes if you catch a buck, you know, and, and, and you didn't see the bed and you catch a buck bass, you hey, know, there. don't be afraid to throw right back in the same spot, you know? Don't be afraid to do that. I had a friend of mine last year. They were in a tournament, and uh, the guy in the fr uh, back of the boat cast it between two docks, and he caught a buck bass, and he's reeling it in, and he and he get and the other guy in the front of the boat he cast to the same spot while the, the while the guy in the back of the boat's reeling this fish in, and he gets the net to net the buck, but it's like a two and a half pounder. He goes up, grabs his rod, he's like, "Oh dang, I got one!" He catches a ten and a half you know, out of the same spot. So, but they never saw the bed. They just knew like he caught this, the buck and then he threw back to the same spot. That's, that's where he caught the buck at. And then he ended up catching a 10 and a half pounder out of the same spot without ever even seeing them there. So it, it does, it does. It's a good idea to keep casting in the same area. If you catch a buck bass, you know, yeah. if, if that buck bass has red eyes, yellow, red eyes, you know, it's a buck and it's on a bed. And if they're peeing, they're for sure on a bed and uh, you're for sure, you know, that, there's a good chance there's a female in the area. Yeah. We got Bass Geek tuning in tonight. He says, I call it circles. They claim the area by making big circles. And as they get smaller, they get meaner. <laughs> so thanks for tuning in there, Bass Geek. Appreciate it. Thanks for the comment. Yeah. And I like to make them mad when they're on the beds. I throw yep. at their tail sometimes, you know, yeah. try to hit them in the tail with your bait. Or jerk it in their face. A lot of yeah. times you try to hit them in the face with it. They na their natural instinct is just hit it, and a yeah. lot of times catch them just like that. You know. Yeah, man, I I've love. Heard, some I've heard fish. Scott Martin talking about that. He he calls it hopping it. You kind of hop it into its mouth, and you yep. 
you know, essentially just like you said, you hop it right there in its face and it just opens its mouth and sucks it in. Yeah, it's like an instinct to them. They just mm -hmm. face their eye. they bite it and I mean just set the hook. Yeah, that's awesome. I just you know, the the one of the things that we run run into here around, you know, the Nashville area is that unless you get lucky and find a good pocket or something, usually you can't see the beds. Uh, but every now and then you'll get into a clear area and uh, you can. So I'm just hoping I'm able to find some this year because I want to get it on video. Hey, you take a road trip to Texas. <laughs> yeah. I'm Man, ready. I, Let's go. <laughs> I know. Man, I remember, I remember one time down on that tournament where I had a boat wreck uh, or the guy ran over my trailer. Man, on on uh Cedar Creek Lake, the water was so clear. I mean, I say so clear compared to here. It was like four or five feet. And I got into an area and I mean, you could just count them, you know, one, two, three, four. Oh yeah. That one's got a buck on it. No, there's two on that one. I mean, it was, it was insane. I loved it. It's so oh. much fun. Your time of the year. That's, buff. That, that's a question for you, David. So, when you're practicing and you see beds, do you make your waypoint according to how quick you think the fish will bite? Uh, well, I, I, I kind of make my waypoints based on the size of the fish. Okay. So if I see a five plus pounder, I'm like, Hey, that's going to go pretty far in the tournament, you know? And so I put a different colored waypoint on a fish like that. If I see a, a solid three pound buck, you know, I might, I'll put a different weight color waypoint on it, but I try to keep track of them. And I make a pretty good game plan before tournament day. Like, hey, you know, we're, I, you know, either a, I'm going to go to the biggest one first, or I'm going to go to where there's two big ones within pretty short distance of each other. You know, I might, they might only be 20, 30 yards from each other. And if you got two people in the boat. Ideally, you want to go where one guy can throw on one, one guy can throw on the other, and kill mm -hmm. two, on, catch two of the big ones. You know, first thing. But that's usually what I do. I spend all day looking for them. I mark them. I know a lot of guys don't like to do that, but I do. I mark them. And then I go back to them in the tournament. Um, you know, it's almost like a milk run. I just say, okay, let me go check that seven pounder. Let me go check this one. And then if they're there, uh, and you know, like I said, then it becomes, okay, now I'm paying attention to the fish's personality. Is it going to bite? Is it not going to bite? And then if, you know, um, there's been times where I've wasted some time in a tournament and way more time than I should have you know, trying to get a fish to bite, um, you know, everybody's different. You know, do you, do you spend 10 minutes on it? You spend an hour on it. You spend two hours on it. You know, I guess it all depends on what you, if you, how bad you need that fish. Um, I, I got almost caught up in one last year. I found three over 10 and I spent two hours on each of them and I didn't get any, any three of them to bite. So uh, I was like, Oh my God, I'm scrambling, like going like racking my brain. Like, man, you just wasted half, over half your day trying to catch these fish, you know? And then I ended up catching five, four pounders. And uh, I had 20 pounds and I came in second. So, uh, you know, you know, you got to pay attention. Like, hey, am I wasting too much time on this fish? You know, like I said, you, a lot of times you trick yourself into thinking you can get it to bite. And really, it's just it's a waste of time. You're like, OK, it's time to move on. Yeah. Uh, Bass That's Geek made a comment. Uh, we dink a link a worm around for smallmouth up here. If y'all don't know, he's from uh, Kentucky up uh up above the knoxville area and uh he has a lot of smallmouth or bass geek are the smallmouth on beds in uh your secret lake up there but uh would you have chris no oh I'm, i thought I'm, i interrupted you i'm sorry no i'm curious to see what bass geek responds with about the smallmouth up there because uh that may dictate or could be an indicator of what's going on elsewhere yeah yeah <laughs> i caught one last year. i caught a about a four pound smallmouth on a bed here and i remember going over it looking in the water going man that looked like a small mouth i was like there's no way and i turned around sure enough it was and ended up catching it and it was pretty cool yeah uh i i know this uh i think the small mouth are starting to get on beds at dale hollow because uh there were a lot of slot fish caught uh so if the, if any any of you guys out there are going to go to Dale Hollow for a fun fishing trip. Uh, I don't plan on putting the boat in anytime soon up there, but um, 
I think the smallmouth were going on bed last week or starting to because uh, a lot of slots were caught and a slot fish there, or, you know, is um, 16 to what, 21 inches or 22? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. 21. Yeah. I, I actually had one on tournament day um, that I had to release, but yeah, the, uh, I think, I think the smallmouth bite is really turning on there right now. Yeah. Bass geeks like B Bristol is where I'm from. And uh, the full moon means a lot. So, yeah. So that'll be what the third week of April, I believe, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there, there again, you know, uh, is it water temperature? Is the moon, you know, we have everything in place right now except for the moon. And, and David, you're saying you like the black moon. So, dark moon, they, they, yeah. Spot. So yeah. during my mind that they I want to go doodle socking one one full moon night. Do y'all know what that is? I have no idea. Do you do David? No. Oh, okay. So uh you basically take the heaviest action rod that you can get and, and the longer the better, eight, nine foot. And at night you go down the bank and you you can use a buzz bait or you can use something pop. that 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 you that you pop it with a little cork and yeah. you just pop it in figure eights and yeah. you just go down the bank when and I they just in, there were some guys that would do that on the river use those almost like a cane pole almost yeah like a buzz yeah. bait force and working in a figure eight right up against the bank there you go yeah jim i'll send you a video when we get done i can't i can't stop watching it's an hour long of these guys doing it but these big fish hit it and you have that much line out because your rod is just over the water and you got to jerk them up in the boat that's Looks like a heck of a lot of fun <laughs> that's crazy yeah i'm really looking forward to getting out on the water and start making my way shallow to start looking at uh seeing if we can find some fish on beds or making beds and I'm really excited about it. But, Chris, man, good luck on your tournament coming up this weekend. Uh, I hope you get on them. Uh, and, if you know, we'll have – of course, we'll be back next week, and you can tell us what you did. And, uh, man, uh, run your GoPro, man. Maybe I can get some footage off of your card, and we can show everybody. And, Dave, I wanted to thank you, man, for coming on tonight. Happy birthday, Chief. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Thanks for having me. And uh, I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and, and telling us the stories on, on your fishing in Texas and Florida. And if you're ever up in the Tennessee area, man, you know, give me a holler. I got a bed, I got a bed and I got a plenty of room for you to park your boat and charge it up. And uh, it's, a, it's always open for a uh, brother and a shipmate. You know that? Sounds good. I'll have to make that happen. We'll have to make yeah, that happen. Yeah, yeah. But everybody that stayed with us for, you know, almost an hour and 40 minutes, I really appreciate y'all tuning in tonight. And, uh, man, thank y'all so much uh, for, you know, giving support to Big Jim Fishing and watching the live. And, uh, you know what, it, who knows what we're going to talk about next week. But uh, once again, uh, Chris, Dave, thanks for coming on. And guys, we will see you next week on Dialed In Live.